my whole basis for everything I do is finding more happiness in life. And the more that I complained, the less happy I was. Welcome to Success Insider, a podcast for emerging leaders and anyone seeking motivation, inspiration, and business or career advancement. Brought to you by Success Magazine. Listen, learn, grow. To complain or not complain is the theme of this week's episode. First, we sit down with best-selling author and organization expert, Mary Colla Magno, to talk about her month of not complaining and how it changed her perspective on life. Then we go to the mailbag to discuss a reader complaint about gender attitudes and society in the workplace. And now our hosts, Shelby Skirhawk and Josh Ellis. I think things are going pretty, pretty well here on this little podcast. We've got some momentum. I think we've had some good episodes. I think that last episode about confidence has really taken a hold. I am, I am walking a little prouder and, and skipping a little a little more through the hallways, just like you promised you would. You know what I've noticed is that you're, you're not complaining as much. I mean, gosh, you just always were finding fault with things, and, and now... You're uh, you're way more content, you know. You you just seem more peaceful. I am. Um, I think you you hit something there. I think uh, focusing on the negative, focusing on what things aren't going right or what could be done better. I've been guilty of that in the past, but I think I've turned over a new leaf, if you will. Yeah, you're you're pretty great, and I'm pretty great too. This is an artfully steered uh, introduction <laughs> because today we're talking all about complaining and complaints. Magno is a best-selling author, organizer, speaker, and spokesperson specializing in helping individuals and groups embrace simplicity in everyday life. She's one of the nation's leading experts on organizing and a frequent contributor on national television, radio, and print. The new book, which inspired her recent article on success, is called Give It Up, My Year of Learning to Live Better with Less. Mary, it's great to have you with us. Thank you for having me. We loved your article in success. Uh, Based on the book, it was um, a challenge. You went a month, 30 days with no complaining. Let's start with this. Why did you decide to stop complaining for 30 days? Where'd you get that idea? Well, it's interesting because I have given up so many different things throughout my life's journey. And um, I wanted to do something that was a little less materialistic. You know, I didn't want to give up something dietary like coffee or something delicious like chocolate or something um, that's an addiction for me, which is shopping. I wanted to do something a little bit um, more esoteric. So I thought, what's something that I just do automatically without thought? And um, what's something that I could stop doing and improve my life. So, you know, I look at it in two different ways. What's maybe taking up some time and becoming habit forming and what could be taken away to give some sense of appreciation and improvement. And I thought that the idea of complaining has become so pervasive in our society, whether it's through Facebook or social media or, you know, kibitzing with your neighbor about, you know, when they're picking up the garbage, it's just something that becomes a snowball effect that once you start it, it keeps going. And um, my whole basis for everything I do is finding more happiness in life. And the more that I complained, the less happy I was. So that was really the structure I was working with when I chose this to give up. So then did you find this kind of converse relationship that if you're focusing on the bad, if you're focusing on all the negative things in your life, you're not making room for happiness? Absolutely true. I mean, I found that it was almost exhausting to even some of the people that I knew that I I had stopped complaining. So I had said, I'm going to stop. And in many times, it was a bite your tongue reaction. It was don't do it. Don't say anything. And that's often hard for someone who likes to talk (laughs) or give commentary, which I like to do both. And um, it was exhausting to think through it, to just make yourself stop. So it was really interesting to see what your knee-jerk reactions were moving forward and how you could retrain your reactions, you know, retrain the way you react to somebody rather than giving in to what they're complaining about, pulling back and you see they're being silent or trying to add something positive. 
Yeah. So what were some of those more difficult parts? You said, you know, kind of the biting the urge and, and biting your tongue. What were some of the toughest parts of stopping complaining? I think it's the fact that everyone around you seems to be on the complaining train. You go on Facebook and there's people just constantly giving commentary. And I think it's really a general idea of what's going on in our world right now is that we all have the technology and the ability to make comments. And instead of taking a positive approach sometimes, I think it's easier and it makes us maybe feel a little better to take more of a negative approach or to complain or to be what I call snarky. And I think that that's become really, really prevalent in our society with the way the media is, with the way reality TV is, with having almost to be choosing sides constantly. So for me, it was, let's not choose sides. Let's look at this objectively. Let's remove the emotion from it and try to make it positive. So your story really inspired uh, something that we're doing in most, if not every issue, which is a challenge. We do like, just as you did, we challenge a writer or an editor to take on something that is meant to make change in them. Uh, uh, and so I, to talk through that change process and how things evolved for you, uh, what did you learn during your month of not complaining? Well, I learned definitely to exercise patience a bit more. And I also began to look at things from the other side. And I started thoughtfully thinking, well, what would I do if I were in that situation? How would I have acted? And, and to act a bit more with intention. Um, the whole idea of give it up the book, the whole idea of giving anything up for four weeks is that psychologists say that it takes four weeks to make a good habit or break a bad one. So that's always been something that I've just thought about. Okay, in four weeks, I could make a change. And I think we're, again, so used to this really rapid fire society where there's an extreme makeover. I always tell my clients um, when I'm organizing them that the extreme makeover crew is not coming. So just be prepared for the long haul because I think we want it to happen overnight. And I think the idea of subtle change is much more lasting. It works. I can tell you it works. Look at anybody who does exercise or practices, you know, anything that needs practice. I look at it this way, an Olympic athlete, a concert pianist, it all takes practice and ritualistic behavior. And that's what I was practicing during this month of complaining on a day to day, hour to hour, minute by minute basis to retrain some of those nasty little urges, as I would call them. So being able to change your own behavior without necessarily, you know, having control over others' behavior, I think that's certainly challenging. How have you changed since? I mean, have you found, you know, absolutely you complain less, like you, you gave up that bad habit? Yes. And, you know, it's hard too to not let the other people around you affect how you feel. I mean, that's really what it is. It's, it's the whole idea of really directing yourself inner instead of having the uh, stimulus come from the outside. And that's what I always say when I work with a lot of people who like to shop and are shopaholics and hoarders. And they're oftentimes looking at the stimulus from outside, like, hey, there's that little black dress. I have to get it. It's not going to be there. And I always tell them, it's going to be there. And you know what? It might even be on sale. So you can hold on. There's there's really no scarcity of, of good um, things to buy in this world, you know? So it's that feeling of having to get it because someone told you to get it and complaining the same way. I, I could complain because they're complaining. So they're going to let me off the hook a little bit so I can jump in. So rather than going in with that outward um, stimulus, I was going inward and saying, how can I direct this in a different way? How can I direct my feelings and manipulate the feedback a little bit? And maybe if I say something positive, then maybe it'll turn the conversation around. And then I guess it's like that commercial in, from the 70s, and they told two friends, and so on and so on, you know. So you just kind of get this new philosophy going, this new way of, of thought. And I think that that's really, in the best case scenario, that's what Facebook and social media can be. It can be the positive change that keeps going instead of being a vehicle for people to vent or get upset because those things really don't help. They only add to more misery as far as I'm concerned. And I certainly learned that through this month, that the more that I complained, the less happy I was. This month where I stopped and took a beat, quieted down a little bit, I felt much more relaxed and much more able to deal with the situation rather than how I felt about the situation. And I think that was a key learning. 
a little later in this episode of Success Insider, we're going to be talking through a complaint that we got from a reader. To me, without giving too much away, it seems like a valid one. There are valid complaints, right? And, and how do you judge uh, which is which? I think the absence of emotional evaluation, the absence of judgment, you can look at things critically. Certainly, we have a lot of opportunity right now to look at our politicians and how they are presenting their policies and how they are dealing with their opponents. So these are, you know, there's different ways you can argue and complain and uh, rather not complain, disagree and not complain about it. So I think it's really much more the idea of dealing with the task, dealing with the issue rather than dealing with the person and saying, you know, there's quite a difference between saying, I don't like the information that was put forth in this article because uh, it's incorrect due to A, B, and C, rather than I really don't like the person who wrote this, and this is why. <laughs> so I think it's, you know, you're making it less personal and less emotional, because just because you disagree with somebody doesn't mean you have to dislike them. So we can look forward to the positive effects of a lack of complaining in your life. Can you tell us kind of what effect complaining has on your overall health and psyche? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, if you think about what you want to attract in the world, you know, if you think about what you're, the energy you're putting out there, you will have a much more calm existence if you're not complaining. And then I think that leads to more happiness. It leads to cultivating relationships that are healthier, bringing people into your life that are more positive, because we all have those friends in our lives that want to just go out and I call it venting over venties. They just want to sit and have coffee and just complain. And I think for a while that was a good idea. People thought, this is great. I'm venting. I'm letting this all out. But what do you end up with after that? You just feel terrible. So I think turning it around to making it more of a positive experience, I think really enriches your, your family life. It enriches the relationships you have with your spouse, your children. And I think it really can help in dealing with your friendships and any relationship you have, because if you're positive about it, people are going to be attracted to you. You're going to attract positive people. And that's a much better way to live than to be that person that, you know, maybe people are avoiding because they know they're going to get an earful. Personal happiness was your goal when you started this. What advice do you give someone who wants to improve their own happiness? Um, as far as complaining, I think it's just trying to keep it positive. Certainly you can voice your disagreement about something, but just not make it personal. And I think when we begin to make things personal, it's when we really start to erode our humanity. You have to treat people with the respect that you want to be treated with. It's reciprocal. So I think you have to be really just treating people the way that you want to be treated. And something as small as complaining is a really good first step to that ultimate journey of happiness. Well, I know that there will not be a lot of people complaining about this interview. Mary, it is uh, just great insight, and uh, it was an awesome story. It was great to talk to you. Thanks very much. Thank you for having me. It was a real pleasure. No complaints here. Well, so Mary gave us uh, all the reasons why we should give up our complaining and the benefits of letting go of all that negativity. But, Josh, I understand you've got yourself a... Uh, a complaint on your hands. Yeah, we uh, sometimes we do get letters to the editor here that to one extent or another are valid complaints. And I thought this one was really interesting. I thought it was a valid complaint. It was one that is, an, I think, an honest mistake, but that uh, it's sort of a, a jumping off point to a bigger discussion. So I want to read this letter to you, okay? All right. It is from, uh, and, and I've, I've changed the name of the emailer to protect the innocent. We'll call this author Aaron, okay? Okay. Aaron says, hello, I can't find a way to contact Darren Hardy, so I'm asking you to forward this to him on my behalf. Now, if I can call a timeout, Zach Morris style, <laughs> uh, I should explain that if you're brand new to success, Darren Hardy was our former publisher. He is no longer with the magazine. But in any uh, respect, Darren was a, a big part of what we did here for a long time. Still, I, I think that we'll move on. And, and, and where, sh where Aaron says references Darren Hardy, we'll just pretend like she's talking to you and me, okay? Okay. Aaron says, I was listening to a past issues CD yesterday, and in one of his stories... 
Darren recounted how he was running from an angry dog in fear. When he did, he said he screamed like a 12-year-old girl who had just seen a spider under her bedsheets. This is important. Is there a reason Darren didn't say he screamed like a 12-year-old boy? Boys' voices haven't usually changed by that age, so the scream would have been just as high. Or perhaps he could have said, I let out an embarrassing high-pitched scream. Why genderize it? I have stopped listening to the CDs. Why, in 2016, do I still have to put up with men making a joke about their behavior by liking it to a girl? Such seemingly innocuous quips are rooted in deeply embedded sexism, and frankly, I expect the publishers at Success to be more careful and thoughtful with their words. Success lost a customer today. Aaron. Ouch. That one stings. It stings anytime uh, we lose a customer. I don't know to what extent I am qualified to even comment on this one. Judging by what we just heard from Mary, Carla Magno, I, it seems like one of those complaints that you, uh, Aaron, the writer, you would be happier if you let this stuff sort of roll off your back. But I am not, I'm not a woman. And so I, I really wanted to get, Shelby, your perspective on genderizing uh, something like to say, Darren saying that he screamed like a 12-year-old girl. Is that hurtful? Well, she might have a point. This idea of doing something like a girl uh, reminds me of a Super Bowl ad that ran a couple of years ago where it was all examining that phrase, hashtag like a girl, and whether or not that is an insult. Because in essence, you're saying that if you throw like a girl, if you run like a girl, if you fight like a girl, you, you don't have the same power. You're not doing it as well. Yeah, I remember that ad. It was by like... Uh... Playtex or always that's well one that was the first time that you know a feminine product had been advertised during a Super Bowl you know huge sports event but this was a pretty groundbreaking campaign women watch the Super Bowl too let's not genderize the viewers of of the biggest television event of the year exactly I think that that ad definitely hit home because at the end of it they ask a, a young girl how do you run like a girl and she says you just run as fast as you can. And basically the point of it was that we, as a society, sometimes kind of have a role in self-esteem plummeting. And I think they quoted a statistic that at puberty, girls and boys have equally high self-esteems. And then for young girls, it tends to drop. And, and maybe that's because of the societal norms that, that we put on girls and maybe uh, that sort of thing carries over into the working world. You know, there are much larger problems that have to do with things like the gender pay gap and lower rates of entrepreneurship among women. But I do wonder uh, to what extent this sort of thing that we're talking about right now uh, has an effect. There's plenty of studies that have shown that there is definitely a, a gender bias, um, a gender gap, if you will. I'll pull some interesting stats from a 2015 Women in the Workplace report by Lean In and McKinsey and Company, and it talks all about these things. It's, it's really fascinating. So the likability bias. So I'll read this quickly. Success and likability are positively correlated for men and negatively correlated for women. If a woman is competent, she's not perceived as, as being very nice, whereas if she seems nice, she's considered less competent. This bias often surfaces in the way that women are described. So when a woman asserts herself, she's often called aggressive, ambitious, out for herself, or editorialization here are some other worse words that, that don't start with A. When a man does the same, he's seen as confident and strong. So as a result of this double standard, women can face penalties in the workplace, like missing out on, on hiring opportunities or advancement opportunities because of this very tangible likability bias. All right, last one here is maternal bias. Motherhood triggers assumptions that women are less competent and less committed to their careers. As a result, they are held to higher standards and presented with fewer opportunities. Men are not immune to scrutiny either. 
Studies show that fathers receive lower performance ratings and experience steeper reductions in future earnings after taking some time away for family reasons. Shelby, I hate this one. I'm, I know. I'm so far away from having kids, but uh, I want to have paternity leave. I want to be every bit as involved in uh, my kid's life, if I am so lucky uh, one day to, to have them, as would be expected of of a woman. Right. I don't, and I don't mean expected of a woman. I, I, I just mean maybe accepted in a woman. Yeah, no, you're right. It's a shame that men who want to be involved with their kids and have more of an equal partnership in parenthood that that is that actually detracts from them that the more time that they take off the more uh things you know the more afternoons that they leave early to go to you know their son's play that that actually counts against them and and, you know I, i think we we've seen it kind of in our own environment here we had a business manager here who, yes, he was here bright and early, but, you know, every day at five, five sharp, you know, he left because he was, you know, very involved with his kids' sports. You know, he was a coach. He was, you know, a very committed dad. And sometimes you would kind of get the impression, oh, you know, you would just, you would hear like an off comment, like, oh, he's already left. Oh, I guess, you know, he's he's gone. It's five o'clock, isn't it? Like, what's wrong with that? You know, when did becoming a good parent affect your job performance. So it's, yeah, I have to say that I I am very kind of personally affected by this because one, you know, God, the mommy guilt is awful and you're already beating yourself up for leaving the office early when you need to go pick up your son or you've, you know, he's got some event that you need to go to. And so you feel like you're not doing your your job at the office very well. But then when you get home and you've got all of this work that you need to catch up on, you know, then you've got the office kind of pulling at your conscience and you're worrying about, am I really being present you know, for, for my family? Am I being a, a good mom here? That push and pull is is so personal for people that it can get me choked up a little bit about about this. So the study hits home, and I think it's definitely got some validity to it. You know, the only way around this I see, and, and maybe the progress of, of workplace culture in America is, is can catch up to it at some point. I, I would like to think so. But the obvious way around this for people, if, if you don't like being put in that position, is, is something that we are huge cheerleaders of, and that's entrepreneurship. My dad was a small business owner, and he was able to come to Little League baseball games and middle school football games and golf tournaments to see me shoot like 130 uh, (laughs) the next town over. Uh, And I'll never forget that. But he was just fortunate enough to have freedom of his own his own time and where he wanted to be during the day. And I'm so lucky for that. And and it makes me sort of uh, think about uh, maybe that possibility whenever the time comes and I do have a family of my own. Yeah. So I'm, I'm so glad that we got this email from uh, Aaron. It, it just got us talking about something that was really important. The study concludes from that, uh, the Lean In and McKinsey and Company Women in the Workplace study, they, they conclude with a checklist for managers. You and I are both managers. So I thought we should read over these to kind of uh, help ourselves and maybe keep some other folks who are in charge of people out there in line. You want to take number one? Definitely. So conduct regular check-ins with the individuals on your team to understand their aspirations and what's driving their desire or lack of desire to advance. So unless you understand what's affecting women's ambitions, you can't do anything to encourage them. So understand what it is that they're seeking. What is that ambition? What's driving the desire for them? Yeah, these are just great leadership principles. Number two, tap women and men equally to take on high profile assignments and new opportunities and push back if women say they're not ready or not qualified. In addition, track the distribution of mission critical work to make sure it's evenly divided among women and men. Now, that's interesting to push women because, of, again, from this study, we've shown that and we've read in other articles that women don't put themselves out to uh, be promoted to be in leadership positions until they feel they are absolutely ready that they're almost you know overqualified that they've got this whereas a man has more of a tendency to go ahead and put himself out for that leadership position when he thinks he's got the potential when he thinks he's right on the cusp of kind of being ready and so when someone says i'm not ready i'm not qualified no that's you know i don't think i'm i'm the person for that 
respectfully kind of push on them and encourage them. And especially if you're their direct manager and you've got that good relationship and understand where they're coming from, I think you'll be surprised at the positive impact it'll have on your team and also the positive on your team member, because I think they will appreciate that gentle nudge. And number three, talk openly about the trade-offs between staff roles and line roles. You know, line roles are like big picture things, the things that really drive your organization or, or your department forward. And staff, staff activities are like the day-to-day -day things that you do. All right, make sure that everyone understands that the type of experience that you can gain in those line roles, the big picture jobs, accelerate your advancement and more often lead to the C-suite. You want everybody to appreciate that they do have a voice in the big ticket items. You know, I need to find a study that I read a while back that talked about certain departments that are more prone to advancement you know, being in a strategy, being in a marketing role. I remember it talked about HR and it talked about accounting, that those two departments, they tend to, I guess, have a, a higher percentage of females in leadership roles, uh, but also those departments are a little bit flatter, a little bit, there's not as many um, functions within it, and they less often lead to the true C-suite, you know, a, a vice president, a, you know, a CEO, a COO, whereas, you know, if you're in a, a, a more visible position, a more visible department, uh, that will end up kind of taking you further. I need to find that study because that was an interesting one. But great takeaways from the study, and, and, and maybe we've learned that complaining is a way of kind of putting a microscope, yeah, putting a microscope on things. Uh, and really determining whether or not it, it, you know, valid for discussion. In this case, I think there was, there was some, some heart, some truth to this, but uh, complaining for the sake of complaining isn't the way to go. You gotta think, you gotta understand, you gotta really dive into what it is that you're examining. Yeah, there's, there's a time and a place for everything, and I think complaints are definitely included. You don't want to go overboard, though, as, as Mary Carla Magno was saying, because it can really affect your attitude, and your attitude so often affects your results. I think that the overarching lesson, the takeaway, has got to be that uh, complaining too much can bring you down, but there are definitely some relevant things that are worth bringing up and bringing to people's attention, and you can make change that way. Complaining for the right reason, it definitely, yeah. Playing off, you know, making change, yes. If you're complaining about things that aren't balanced, that things that aren't right, that, you know, in some type of social injustice, you know, that complaining is productive. And so I guess understanding the difference between productive and non-productive complaining, choosing which one to take action on. Yeah, I, I wouldn't complain that uh, someone's talking too loud in the office. What good does that really do? Just drown them out, throw some headphones in, pick your spots and uh, just like the boy who cried wolf, right? Like the, right. Uh, or should I say the girl who cried wolf? <laughs> the person? Yes, the individual who cried wolf. If they only did it once, then it would carry a lot more weight in the end. It's been a really good episode, I think. Uh, and I'm glad that I'm glad that we had that uh, that chat about gender. No complaints here. Yeah, nice. Uh, okay, that's it for this week. Don't miss Success Insider next week. There's always a lot to learn, a lot to talk about for you and I, Shelby. Uh, we hope you learn something every week from us. Our focus for the upcoming episode is all about learning new skills, like a, uh, a how-to on how-to, if you will. Till then, I'm Shelby. And I'm Josh, and we will see you next week. Bye.